My favorite show of all time is Dave the Barbarian. Yes, it's true. I love it more than all those other shows I've sung the praises of, like Modern Family, Friends, Moral Oral, Dan Versus, and even Drawn Together. I've been riding with Dave since 2004, and I don't think I'm ever gonna stop. So I don't really think there's anyone better out there to tell you everything you need to know about Dave the Barbarian. By the way, this is our 9,000 subscriber special. It still sounds weird to me, 9,000 subscribers. Wow. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate you and we really, really appreciate that you had us do this for the big celebration. Yay! Also, because next time it's going to be considerably less fun. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. It's time for you to learn everything you need to know about Dave the Barbarian. Dave the Barbarian was a Disney Channel animated comedy series created by Doug Langdale. He had previously created another Disney show called The Weekenders. The show primarily took inspiration from two shows, Rocky and Bullwinkle and The Roman Holidays. Though it must be said that Roman Holidays is an unconfirmed inspiration, it's just that a lot of people have drawn parallels from that show and Dave the Barbarian. Although honestly, Dave the Barbarian is significantly better. Just saying. The two shows are often compared because they both take ancient times and put them in anachronistic modern settings. And Rocky and Bullwinkle is a major inspiration in the writing. There's a whole lot of quips and subversions that are often found in Jay Ward style shows that are found everywhere in Dave the Barbarian. Half the time it kind of feels like a stand-up routine as much as it does a show. The show revolves around Dave. He's a barbarian who doesn't really want to be a barbarian. The only reason he became a barbarian at all was because he thought it was a librarian that also cuts hair. He's a cowardly guy who'd rather macrame or make art or write songs about pastries than fight the forces of evil. It's just that his family forces him into it. His family and his talking sword. He's played by Danny Cooksey, who you might recognize for playing Bobby Budnick, Jack Spicer, or Montana Max. His older sister, Candy, is the heiress to the throne. Yeah, did I forget to mention that Dave's parents... Rokhtar and Glimia are the king and queen of the kingdom of Udragoth. So Dave is both a prince and a barbarian. Candy is a princess in every sense of the word. She's spoiled, she's snobby, she's arrogant, but she also wants to do the right thing when it's convenient for her. Her actress has actually been in Shining Time Station. You remember that show, don't you? That show that Britt Alcroft, the woman who made the Thomas the Tank Engine TV show, made so us US audiences would like Thomas a lot more, but ended up going out of control and giving us Thomas and the Magic Railroad? Yeah, that one. Also, I have to mention that Candy is named after Doug Langdale's wife. Kind of funny that he chose the least moral of the main characters to name her after, but eh, it's something, you know? It's definitely nice. Could be worse too, he could have named Faffy Candy instead, and I'm sure that would have caused a whole lot of problems. Dave also has a little sister, who may or may not visually be inspired by Pebbles from Flintstones. That's never been confirmed, it's just a little bit of a comparison I've always drawn. This is Fang. She's everything that Dave isn't. She's small, she's scrawny, she's got a real big temper, and she loves nothing more than wanton destruction. She's the one who pushes Dave into most of his dangerous escapades, because she wants to be a barbarian herself. However, she's seen as too small, and also seen as a monkey. That's one of the show's main running gags. Everyone thinks she's a monkey. She's played by Tress McNeil, who's been in everything, ever. Their parents, Throctor and Glimia, are currently fighting evil all around the world, so they are not there right now, but they do check in quite often through the Mystic Cauldron of Summoning or the Crystal Ball. Luckily, they're being watched after Glimia's brother, Oswidge, who's a sorcerer, but he sucks at it really badly. He never really went to sorcerer school, he just worked in the kitchens, and I guess he kind of picked up some magic from side conversations or reading little snippets of books he stole from students. Whenever he tries to do magic, it goes horribly wrong. Don't tell him that, though, he's very insecure about it, but one thing he's not insecure about is how much he loves to eat. He's played by Kevin Michael Richardson, who's been in also a lot of things. Dave's talking sword Lula is very sassy and tries to whip Dave into shape, but of course to no avail. She's played by Estelle Harris, also known as Mrs. Costanza from Seinfeld and Mrs. Potato Head from the Toy Story series. The cast is rounded out by Faffy, the lingling of a show. That means he's a character that doesn't speak English and therefore is kind of pushed off to the side more often than not. He's played by Frank Welker because he's an animal. By law, every animal has to be played by Frank Welker or else the show creator gets 
thrown in jail. We also have the storyteller, the narrator of the show, obviously, who likes to butt his head in and talk to the characters and mess with the story sometimes. Yeah, he's like the word girl narrator in that remark, and hey, just like the word girl narrator, he's really funny. They also have a series of villains that often try to make life miserable for them, like the Dark Lord Chuckles the Silly Piggy. He's played by Paul Rudd, also known as the director from Animaniacs. Chuckles' goals seem to fluctuate throughout the show. He either wants to take over Udragoth or he wants to destroy it. But no matter what, he's bent on making life miserable for everybody else. And it's for no other reason than because he's a Dark Lord of Evil. What else is he gonna do? There's Malsquando, who's basically the anti Oswidge. Whereas Oswidge is short, Malsquando is tall. Oswidge has terrible clothes, but Malsquando's are all fine and probably expensive. And most importantly, whereas Oswidge is terrible at magic, Malsquando is really good at it. In fact, he's probably the best sorcerer in the world. But he uses it for evil, mostly for his own selfish purposes. What he wants to do is reign over the whole world, basically just to flex how awesome he is. Quasmir, an ancient Udragothian god who has various strange issues, let's just leave it at that. Ned Frischman, Man of Tomorrow, who, yes, is played by Daggett Beaver from Angry Beavers and Zim from Invader Zim, uses his magical time zipper to go back in time and wow people with his futuristic technology. And finally, evil Princess Irma Plotz. She serves as Dave's love interest throughout the show, even though she's one of the main villains. She wants to humiliate and ruin Dave's life because he dumped her for being an evil princess. There's a lot of romantic tension in the show that hints that eventually when the show was over, they are gonna get together again and she was probably gonna turn good, but because the show got cancelled after one season, we never really got to see that. And if you're wondering why it got cancelled, hang tight, I'll tell you why in a minute. We've got some other side characters like Mrs. Bogmelon, the greedy Mr. Krabs-esque shopkeeper, Twinkle the Marvel Horse, who's a depressed horse that's a parody of Christopher Walken, the Queen of the Mole People, who's essentially just a running gag throughout the show, and everyone's favorite character, Bob the Invader! I love Bob the Invader. It's an in-joke you guys wouldn't understand. So what happened to Dave the Barbarian? If you look online, you can see so many people going Remember Dave the Barbarian, guys? Whoa! Nostalgia trip! But you can also see them going, wow, this was really good. How did it only last for one season? How did it only get 21 episodes? Two words, Disney Channel. Yes, like I said, Dave the Barbarian aired on Disney Channel, and it got screwed by the network Hardcore. I'm surprised TV Tropes doesn't talk about this because this is really bad. First of all, all the episodes were aired out of order. For a largely episodic show like SpongeBob SquarePants or Dan vs., this isn't really a big issue. When those shows had their episodes aired out of order, most people probably didn't notice. Dave the Barbarian is largely unaffected by this. However, we have some episodes where characters are introduced for the very first time, getting aired around episode 7. Yeah, when we go through these episodes individually one by one, because yes, we're gonna do that today, I'm gonna show you just how weird it was that the pilot episode where the Dark Lord Chuckles the Silly Piggy is introduced to the main cast was aired seventh. Not helping was the fact that the first five episodes, you know, the first five half hours, they were aired all in one day. Not joking, Disney Channel just kind of threw them on the schedule just to burn them all off. But it gets worse. We're gonna get to the airing schedule next. Dave the Barbarian aired in the most random times possible. At first, it looked like they were gonna have a set schedule, but no, they just started having these things pop up out of nowhere, often with little warning. So let's go over these air dates, shall we? Like I said, the first five episodes aired in one day, January 23rd, 2004. The sixth, January 30th, 2004. Then February 6th, 2004, February 13th, 20th, then 27th, okay, seems fine. But then we get to March 19th, 2004, March 26th, April 30th, October 2nd, December 27th, December 28th, December 29th, December 30th, January 17th, 2005, January 21st, 2005, and finally the last episode, Not a Monkey in Happy Glasses, was aired on January 22nd, 2005. And if you thought that was bad, did you know that Dave the Barbarian had three different time slots when it first aired? 
It started off weekdays at 5.30, 4.30 Central, then it changed to weekdays at 4.30, 3.30 Central, which, real quick, if you're gonna change a time slot of a show, make it more publicized, make people aware of it. All they really did was re-air some of the common promos and then just redub the voice at the end a la Warner Brothers ball cap style, briefly stating the new time. Like I said, these promos had been airing ever since Dave the Barbarian was announced to come out. People probably just zoned out when they saw these because they'd been seeing them for months, so they didn't pick up on the new time slot and, uh-oh, they missed the new episode, if they even knew it was gonna be on. Also, bumping back a show like this is the worst thing you can do when changing the time slot. Say you're a really big Simpsons fan and the new episode of The Simpsons, uh, for frame of reference, we're gonna imagine we're in the 90s when The Simpsons was still good, is coming out on Friday at 5 o'clock. Okay, awesome. But then you watch it and you see King of the Hill. Wait a minute, isn't The Simpsons supposed to be on? So you sit there and you watch the new episode of King of the Hill and Family Guy, and then The Simpsons comes on at 6 o'clock. Oh, okay, they bumped it back. So if a show gets bumped back like what just happened in that little explanation, there's still a chance you can catch it. But say the episode of The Simpsons was bumped back to 4 o'clock, you missed it. Sure, you can see it again on a rerun, but two things. One, the network mostly cares how episodes do during their initial run. Reruns are mostly just filler. Unless it's some kind of big marathon meant to draw ratings and ad revenue, most of the time reruns aren't super important to a major cable network. So that means when a new episode ends up bombing, like what happened with Dave the Barbarian after the time slot switched and after they started airing them whenever they felt like it, Disney Channel started looking at the show as a failure. But then the second problem is that Dave the Barbarian started getting fewer and fewer reruns as time went on. I'm looking at a lot of these archived posts about Disney Channel's schedule from 2004 and early 2005, and few if any of them have Dave the Barbarian on as reruns or premieres. This is reminding me of what happened to Harvey Beaks, man. And then they changed the time slot again to weekends at 11 o'clock. Great. And this was just for the last two episodes, by the way. They didn't really do this for the others, and they kind of publicized this one a lot better, as I can find a lot more promos showing it. But by then it was too late. Disney Channel never really officially canceled Dave the Barbarian, they more just put it on a hiatus that everybody knew was just kind of the end. Going back to Dan Versus, which I mentioned in the beginning of the video, the same thing happened to them. They were also put on a hiatus and everyone just kind of gave up and moved on to other things. So yes, technically speaking, Dave the Barbarian could come back, but don't hold your breath, it's probably never gonna happen. So the reason Dave the Barbarian wasn't as big of a hit as it should have been was because Disney Channel didn't let it be a big hit. Thanks a lot, you jerks. Disney Channel was originally hyping this thing up like mad. Dave the Barbarian's theme song was the final track on the Disney Channel CD, Disney Channel Hits Take One. And also, McDonald's got involved and made some pretty lackluster Happy Meal toys based on the show. The only ones that really stand out here are Lula and Faffy here. Even so, that's still really good. Obviously that meant that they were at least trying to make the show a success, but that doesn't mean it was guaranteed to be a success. You know what other wacky single season animated comedy series got Happy Meal toys like this? Cat Scratch, which, for those of you who don't know, is often credited with being the first Nicktoon to be a victim of the at least the first one that was well publicized. So now, because I really want you guys to be interested in Dave the Barbarian and to give the show more of a chance, I'm gonna review every single episode, albeit briefly, for you right now. And I'm also gonna do it in their original order. At the bottom of the screen, we're gonna put what order they actually aired, but just know that for the most part, we're going by production order. There's gonna be one exception, which I'll explain when we get there. So first of all, it's time to talk about the first episode, Way of the Dave. As pilot episodes go, this does a very good job in explaining what the show's supposed to be about. It has Dave being cowardly, it has the storyteller being snarky, it has Fang going, Not what more do you want? This is a perfect introduction to the show. While the writing isn't as sharp as it's going to be later on, once again, it's the pilot. It's supposed to give you a preview for what's to come. And boy does it do it well. So if you are gonna give the show a chance, I'd say start here. Beauty and the Zit was partnered with this, and I used to not like this one actually. I didn't really get it when I was younger. It's basically a Beauty and the Beast parody, but instead of a beast, it's a giant talking pimple. We see a lot of characters just kind of being 
weird but also laid back here. Despite the fact this is a very zany cartoon, this is surprisingly one of the more calm down to earth episodes. There's not a lot of whizzing and zipping and all that, it's mostly dialogue humor in this thing. Like how the Zitz laugh goes on too long, or how Dave's way too excited to be the coat checker, or how much Oswich loves nut logs. Standard Dave the Barbarian, once again, it's partnered with the pilot for a reason. It's kind of meant to show you the other side of the show, when it's not super fantastical and fantasy-esque. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I most certainly do now. Episode 2A, Sorcerer Material. This is the first episode where Mal Squando appears. This one is probably the best Oswich episode in terms of character. We get to see him in a lot more of a vulnerable light. Even though all the characters on the show have some humor elements to them in one way or another, Oswich is kind of the de facto comedic relief character. He's loud, he's silly, he's very goofy, and he loves to eat. Not to mention the fact that he gets his magic wrong more often than not. All of these traits are usually reserved for the comic relief guy, so that's why I've dubbed him the de facto guy, like I just said. But here, Oswich is a lot more of a character than he has been in a lot of the episodes. We see a different side to him being that he's really insecure about the fact he never really went to sorcery school and is therefore not a real sorcerer. It also explains why he's not very good at what he does, and it shows him paling in comparison to his arch-rival, Malsquando, who appears in this episode for the very first time. But just because it's focused on character doesn't mean it's not funny. It's hilarious. As always. It also has a good song number, Life on the Sea. Something that Dave the Barbarian doesn't get a lot of credit for is all the songs it puts in the episodes. They're short, yeah, but they're all really catchy, and more often than not, really funny. Sweet Dreams was aired alongside this one, and this is another one of those times where the out-of-order airing order kinda messes things up. See, Chuckles comes back in this episode and directly references Way of the Dave. While yes, this aired after Way of the Dave, Chuckles only mentions this moment for a reason. He was only supposed to recognize Dave from that moment. If he'd met Dave otherwise, he probably would have mentioned Pet Threat, which is the first episode he appeared in airing-wise. But no, according to continuity, this is the second time they've ever met. I don't really have much else to say about Sweet Dreams except for the fact that it's really freaking funny. But I think that's to be expected when it comes to the show overall. Hey, it's Pet Threat! I just talked about this episode, and honestly, this is probably my second least favorite episode of the show. I used to like it a lot more back then than I do now. It's that typical, oh, we got a new pet, but the pet's causing trouble and the old one's trying to tell us, but we don't believe him trope. But it's kind of bare. There aren't a lot of jokes and the snappy dialogue is surprisingly bare. The whole thing is just kind of, eh. It's standard and standard isn't bad. It's just kind of unremarkable. It does have its funny moments, like just how diseased Carl is, or the line Wake me up again and I'll turn you into a water buffalo's intestinal gas. But those moments are few and far between. Lula's first barbarian is kind of the opposite, where once again it takes the typical trope of the old love interest comes back and the person who used to love them is super into them once again, but uh oh, they're up to something bad, but this time it does a whole lot with it. It seems like all the humor that was left out of Pet Threat was put in here, because everything is firing on all cylinders. The walk minstrel, queen of Queenland, anyone ever tell you you have sweaty palms? Oswich breaking into Candy's girl lair, it's all just super good, and once again this is another episode I didn't really get a lot when I was younger. I was more focused on the story that I wasn't really big on, when I should have been focusing on just how funny it was, which is kind of the whole point of this episode. Dave the Barbarian is a comedy show first and foremost, but that's not to say that it never has its story episodes, though it more tries that towards the end. Until then, we're gonna have to talk about Civilization, our first Fang-centered episode. Fang here is taught to be a civilized lady for once after wrecking candy slumber party, and we kinda realize that Udragoth needs Fang to be absolutely insane and feral, otherwise a horde of bugle beetles are gonna come in and destroy everything and everyone. I like that little notion at the end that yeah, everyone's gonna kind of accept that they need to keep Fang the way she is even if she is dangerous and sometimes annoying to them. It shows they all care. That is one thing I will pride the show on, is that even though a lot of the times the characters are really snippy with each other or get at each other's throats from time to time, 
No matter what, they'll always care about each other and go the extra mile to make things better for each other. This is probably the first time we see it, but it's not going to be the biggest example. Trust me, that'll come later. The Terror of Mechadave. Once again, this is one that I kind of have to skim over because all I can really say is, it's funny. This is also, gotta say, probably one of the funniest Chuckles appearances yet. He doesn't have an evil lair anymore, he's just kind of working at a department store and he's fighting the barbarians while working there. The timing in those sequences is perfect. It's also the first appearance of Twinkle the Marvel Horse. Release the memes! King for a day or two and its sister episode Slay What were episode 5, both in production order and airing order. I think this is the only time that's ever happened. So good job, and two great episodes for this to happen to. I think that these two are some of the funniest episodes in the entire show. Just like Lula's first Barbarian, it's firing on all cylinders. They've also got some great catchy songs like the Strom the Slayer theme song or Oh Pastry. Some of the best and most quotable lines come from these two episodes, that's why I'm covering them together. I can't think of two episodes that were better paired together. They have the same exact strengths and they work with each other perfectly. Here There Be Dragons is a very rare case of a Faffy-centered episode. Like I said, Faffy's like the Ling Ling of a show. He doesn't talk, so he doesn't get attention. This time, though, he actually does. And he gets to do so featuring people that I'm not sure if you've heard of. They're called Metallica. That's not a joke. Metallica was in this episode, and they were awesome. After having an accidental fight with some hilarious nomads, Dave sends Udragoth into an unbearable drought. So he, Fang, and Faffy have to venture out to find the Star of Night, the one thing that can restore water and coldness to all of Udragoth. However, Faffy ends up falling in with the guards, who just so happen to be the dragons, played by Metallica, and becomes evil. Or more specifically, he more just becomes a punk. This is only one of two instances where we see some actual character development from Faffy. The other one is Pet Threat. Like I mentioned, Pet Threat's just kind of an eh episode, but this one's a lot better. Not only is it funnier and it has Metallica, but it's also a lot better written in terms of character. All we really got in Pet Threat was Faffy is jealous. Oh no. This time though, we get to see what does he want more? Does he want friends and peers that he can talk to on an equal level? Or does he want to go back to being a pet and stay loyal to his best buddy Dave? Of course, it's nothing super deep and I'm not going to pretend like it is, but it's nice to see the derpy do-nothing character get something for him for once. Pipe Down is, oddly enough, our first appearance of Quasmir because this aired second in terms of his appearances. Okay. The reason that's weird is because the characters of Ned Frischman, Malsquando, and Quasmir have two standalone episodes each. Irma Plotz kind of does as well. The first episode she appears in is more meant to set her up. She's not as much of an outright villain there. And then she has two episodes after that showing her in a more straight up villainous role. So basically, unless they appear in a cameo or joint appearance, each villain gets two episodes all on their own. Chuckles, however, being the main villain, appears in like, what, a third, half of the episodes, however many? He's exempt from the rule. Both times, though, people are kind of surprised at Quasimir's appearance, so this being aired out of order doesn't really affect it all too much. But I will say that this is probably the better first appearance for Quasimir to have, because he's not as much of a villain as he is in the upcoming episode, the one where we all saw him for the first time. Other than that, funny episode. Not much else to say. Termites of Endearment. It's another Chuckles episode, which is usually a good sign. It most certainly is in this case. A bunch of termites come to Udragoth and eat everything. It's kind of like the Alaskan Bullworm episode from Spongebob, just with the Dave the Barbarian flair. It's got anachronism, it's got witty banter. What more do you want? Thor Loser features Charlie Adler playing Lula's sister, Mjolnir, also known as Molly. This is another episode much like Lula's first Barbarian that takes a tired old trope but makes it interesting because of just how far they go with it. Huh. This actually isn't in the script, but I'm just kind of realizing this now. It seems like the Lula episodes are always taking a tired old story and then putting some of the funniest jokes in the show into it to make it worth your time. Let me just describe this to you. Dave has to pretend to be a ferocious barbarian warrior by fighting off obviously fake monsters. 
Candy has to pretend to be a very successful and much-loved princess by making up admirers, and Fang has to be an elf. I applaud the writers of Dave the Barbarian for taking tired stories and breathing new life into them by just putting in good old effort. That's something that's lacking from a lot of shows that use these tired old premises. Like all those Christmas Carol episodes you see on your favorite cartoons. They just do the story and that's about it. I'm not talking about Mickey's A Christmas Carol, that gets an exception, that's just an adaptation of the book, stop typing. Or you get things like Fairly Odd Parents, It's a Wishful Life, where they put a spin on it, but the spin makes it infinitely worse. The only thing the show has to do in terms of a spin is just to make it ridiculous and funny. And it succeeds on both parts. And trust me, this isn't going to be the last time something like this happens. Maddening Sprite of the Stump was the very first episode of Dave the Barbarian that ever came out. And this was not a good choice. I like this episode, don't get me wrong, but this was probably the worst option you could have picked for a first episode. Okay, no, actually, second worst. A pig story would have been the worst mostly because you need context of the show in order to make it have any sort of impact on you at all. But still, Maddening Sprite of the Stomp going first? So let me tell you why this doesn't exactly work. First of all, it doesn't really show you a lot of the characters all too much. While yes, it's an episode that gives all of the family minus Faffy equal screen time, it doesn't give them any real standout moments to make their personalities more well-known or have any interesting banter that's going to set up what we're going to see throughout the rest of the show. Also, this episode is definitely the gross-out episode. The sprite himself contributes a lot to this. So I'm sure a lot of people who tuned in to see the first episode would have gone, Oh, great. It's another gross-out show. Didn't we leave those back in the 90s? I'm not really sure if that's true, but... Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened for at least a good portion of the audience. That is, until they watched the episode paired with this. Again, this episode isn't bad, but I'd put this in the bottom three for sure. It does have that cut a muffin joke, and that is very funny and very dirty. And I cannot believe that that managed to get in. Wow. Here we have shrink wrap. I hope this is what saved the show's reputation after everybody saw Maddening Sprite of the Stump. Dave becomes a therapist, or psychoflubicologist as he calls it, and proceeds to annoy absolutely everybody until he sees Quasmir and is actually able to help him. In very strange ways, of course. Until it all gets undone again and again. It's silly, it's weird, it's Dave the Barbarian through and through. So I guess when the show premiered, people did get to see what the show would be like. They just had to wait 11 minutes for it to happen. It's about time we had a candy-centered episode, huh? We're like, what, nine episodes in? And we get beef. In order to impress Golder the Hot, Candy tries to beef up and become a muscle woman. But instead of actually working out, she decides to take the easy way out with steroids. I mean magic broccoli. And as her muscles get bigger, her brain gets smaller. So it's up to her family to try to educate her and make her smart again, hoping that that will return her back to normal. For our first Candy-centered episode, we get both a lot and little of character development for her. We get a lot of setup, establishing that she's kind of snobby and spoiled and all that, but she doesn't really progress. However, that's kind of the point of Candy, is that she's probably the least likable of the main cast. She's snobby, she's mean, and most of all, she doesn't really care about anybody else unless it's for her benefit. This often makes her a foil for Dave or Fang or whoever the main character of the episode is, and she's often seen in a more antagonistic light. She's the one that drives the conflict in the family. So if she's shaped up too soon, which means we'd either lose this important trait from her, or she'd end up reverting back to the way she used to be at the beginning of the next episode, and everything would be seen as kind of pointless. So I'd say that Beef did a good job, and it's also really funny, but that goes without saying. Rite of Pillage is another fantastic one. Dave is going through his Rite of Pillage, which basically is, I guess I could put it this way, the barbarian equivalent of a bar mitzvah. This is going to solidify Dave as a true man and a true barbarian. Only problem is, we know that Dave is a complete coward and sissy, so he doesn't really do a good job until the ending, which is kind of a deus ex machina, but it's also hilarious. Tom Kenny plays the pillage master here, and he knocks it out of the park. Whenever they have these guest actors on, like Metallica, Charlie Adler, or Tom Kenny, they always do an amazing job. I'm gonna lump Band and Webb together because, once again, they have the same points. They take stuff from the modern era, lampoon it, and do it in a way that's not dated, not cringy, 
and most importantly, still kind of rings true to this day. It just goes to show you how timeless this show really is. Also, Webb just so happens to have the Steve the Egg song, which is probably the most famous moment from the entire show next to the megaphone bit. So if you're looking for the episode that has that song, this is it. And now we have Girlfriend and Ned Frischman, Man of Tomorrow. I'm not lumping these together. I'm just saying that these two episodes are the ones that introduce our final villains of the show. Princess Irma Plotz and Ned Frischman. By the way, Princess Irma Plotz is voiced by Melissa Rivers. If you don't know who that is, that's Joan Rivers' daughter. And Joan Rivers plays Irma Plotz's mom. This is one of the more story-centered episodes of the show, and it does a good job. Once again, humor is its main focus, and it does that very well. But we get to see Dave be truly in love, and it's kind of sweet. They break up mostly because they know it can't really work with Dave being a good guy and Princess Irma Plotz being evil. Granted, she doesn't take this well and tries to destroy Dave after this, but still, the point stands. You really buy their connection and camaraderie and you want them to end up together by the end of the show. You know it's gonna happen, it's just a matter of when. That's the sign of good writing right there. Ned Frischman, Man of Tomorrow is the episode that I think is probably discussed the most considering it was nominated for an Annie Award. Heck, Mr. N Hunter's even done it, so let me just say that everything he said in that video is 100% correct. Now, I'm not really a super big Enter fan, I just kind of think he's okay. But here he got it 100% right 100% of the time. Great going, man! Thanks for helping bring awareness to the show. I'm gonna do another lump session here. Princess and the Pea Brains and Hoarders and Sorcery. These are episodes that take a closer look at some of the main cast. For Princess and the Pea Brains, it's Candy, and for Hoarders and Sorcery, it's Fang. We see more of their character development, we see them royally screw up, and how they're gonna try to fix that. The villains are on their A game as always, so yes, this is yet another pairing that makes total sense. I'd still say King for a Day or Two and Slay What are better pairings because well, they're S-tier episodes. But I'm not knocking these, not even close. The Brutish Are Coming is kind of your standard Dave the Barbarian episode. It's probably a little lower on the end, but it's still good. Everything I can say about Way of the Dave, except for the introductory stuff, applies to this one too. It's zany, it's wacky, but it's all around funny. Lost Race of Reaver is the episode I point to to show people just how Candy's character is supposed to work. She's not the good guy. Just because she's in the main cast doesn't mean she's morally right. As Dave points out, the only time she does anything for anybody is for selfish motives. And it's not just a problem invented for this episode. Like I've said, it's something that's been prevalent all throughout the series. This is the episode where she gets called out on it, and she's gonna do whatever she can to prove Dave wrong, even though she knows he's actually right. And of course, in doing so, she tries to bite off more than she can chew, but refuses to give up, while also roping her family in on the whole thing as well. And hilarity ensues. By the way, Invisigoths is a great pun. You can really tell that the people behind the show loved ancient history. Later Hosen of Doom, finally Fang is able to be just as strong and dangerous as Dave is. Or at least would be if Dave was willing to act like an actual barbarian. My thing about this episode is that the concept is hilarious. Evil possessed magical pants that want to get revenge on the person who stained them. Which just so happens to be Oswich. And of course the pants came from Malsquando, because why didn't they? This is kind of like something you'd find in The Secret Show, where it's just so ridiculous and off the wall you can't help but laugh. And then we get to floral derangement. Everything I said about Lula's first barbarian or Thor loser applies here, so copy and paste that review and moving on. Fiends and Family, to me, is the most interesting episode of this entire show. It's not my favorite, although it is one of them, but it's an episode of Dave the Barbarian that's more story-focused than everything else. Surprisingly, sometimes the humor takes a back seat. It's still really funny, but it's also really sad. Especially because we never get to see Fang in a vulnerable position up until this point. She's normally been the one to bark orders and try to whip the family into shape, which is kind of strange given the fact she's a little kid, but this episode reminds us of what I just said. She's a little kid. When her mom and dad are out fighting evil and make it clear that they're probably not going to be back for a very long time, she doesn't know how to take it. She wants the family to be whole again. We also get to see the other family members try to cheer her up, though it doesn't really end up working. And then Chuckles, probably in his most villainous appearance yet, or 
maybe even ever in the entire show, decides to take advantage of her missing her family to disguise herself as Throctar, her father, and get her to take this magical idol for him, which turns whoever touches it first into cheese forever. And if you think that Chuckles doesn't know what he's doing, he absolutely does. He even acknowledges the fact that he's basically luring this girl to her doom purely based on emotions. There's still a lot of funny moments here, but wow. I really wish that Dave the Barbarian would have done more things like this because it worked really well. Plunderball is the first time we see Irma Plotz fully as a villain. Once again, she's trying to mess Dave up, but when she actually gets the opportunity, she can't do it. And this shows the audience that you're going to be seeing a whole lot of this. Either she chickens out at the last minute of actually destroying Dave, or her revenge is just going to be petty, which is what we see in the next time she appears, by the way. It parodies sports well, and honestly, I'd actually kind of like to see a Plunderball game because it seems really interesting. But I'm getting into fanboy territory here, so let's move on. So... This episode is a little bit weird to talk about right now, because this was supposed to be the season finale. Yeah, its production order was 16th, but this is clearly supposed to be the way that the season, or I guess if we're judging by the cancellation, the show was supposed to end. This is just a little bit of a PSA for people out there. Production order isn't always the intended airing order. This can be clearly seen here. A pig story is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. It rips apart cartoon tropes like crazy, especially the ones seen in this show. I don't really want to talk about it at length because I really feel like you need to see this for yourself. However, do not, and I repeat, do not see this one first. You need to see a handful of episodes of the show for this stuff to make any sense. I mean, yeah, it'll make sense, but it just won't be funny, and it won't be as funny the second time around. Just a little bit of a warning right there. Not a Monkey is yet another Fang episode. Wow, we've gotten a lot of these, haven't we? And it takes another page from Fiends and Family of trying to develop her character. Of course, it's not nearly as serious as that was. In fact, it's 95% comedy. But it shows that Dave can develop characters in a meaningful way while still being hilarious. Fang ends up getting adopted by a tribe of monkeys and feels at home in their society. Which leads her to question, was everybody right in that running joke? Is she actually a monkey? Good episode overall. And then Happy Glasses. This is the one that ended everything off. This is the last episode of Dave the Barbarian to ever premiere. And unlike Maddening Spider the Stump, this was a good one to go out on. Of course, Pig Story should have been the actual end, but this was still a good choice. Chuckles is at his hammiest here, and it's amazing. We get to see everybody's ideal world when they put on these cursed glasses. This episode also has a remarkable lack of the storyteller. He's there, most certainly, but he's barely in this episode at all. And it works surprisingly well. The characters are able to carry the comedy and story all on their own. That's one of the reasons I like the storyteller so much. He's there when you need him and out of the way when you don't. Of course, he sometimes likes to butt in and it causes a lot of conflict with the characters themselves, leading to some jokes, but you get what I mean. He's not intrusive, he's not annoying, and he's not overused. And Happy Glasses proves it once and for all. That darn ghost. Out of all the episodes here, I think this one's probably the most Jay Ward-esque. You could basically take the script and put it in something like Rocky and Bullwinkle, or George of the Jungle, and aside from the setting and characters, it fit perfectly. The tone, the writing, the situations, it's all so well done. Some of the snappiest and weirdest stuff in the entire show. The Cow Says Moon is another S-tier episode. Dave gets turned into a were-cow by Irmaplots, but then he keeps getting bitten by other things, causing him to turn into were, insert noun here. Once again, takes a cliched premise, overloads it with comedy, and then lets it run wild. That's what the show does best, and it's best proven here. So, a little bit of a personal thing, Night of the Living Plush is the last episode of Dave the Barbarian that I can actually remember being advertised. And it was only once. I only saw the promo for this come on one time, and I missed it. Other than that, we see Candy being selfish and everybody trying to undo her selfishness. But this time, her selfishness is taken to a new high. She's gonna bankrupt the Kingdom of Udragoth just so she can collect more stuffed animals. Dave tries to stop her by singing a catchy and goofy song, and Chuckles is on his A-game. What more do you want? It amazes me that everybody talks about Ned Frischman, Man of Tomorrow so much, but they skip right over I Love Nettie. 
This has everything that made Ned Frischman Man of Tomorrow so good, but kicks it up to 11. Much like Band and Webb, it takes something from the modern era and ridicules it to no end, but it does it in a tasteful and timeless way. And all those corny jokes that Ned tells are just so bad that they're funny. You can't help but laugh. Red Sweater of Courage. This is one that I remember all the kids in my class were talking about. Mostly because there was that Disney Channel game online that you could play that was basically just Pac-Man. And it had the Red Sweater of Courage as the power pellet. So finally we knew what that was referencing. Because of that, this is one that's always stuck in my mind. It's also the only one where we get to see three villains in one episode. We get to see Chuckles, Quasmir, and Mouse Squando, and they bounce off each other perfectly. It's funny and ridiculous all throughout, and hey, if you guys wanted to seek this one out early, it'd probably be a good idea. If they weren't gonna have Way of the Day be the premiere, they probably should have picked this one. It puts the characters fully on display and inverts a common trope that you're gonna see all throughout the rest of the show. But it's not in the same way where a pig story does it and it wouldn't really make any sense if you haven't watched other episodes of the show. No, you'd kind of get it if you watched this for the first time and hadn't seen anything else before it. Then again though, this might not have been the best one to put first because of the episode that comes with it, Dog of Titans. This is the only episode of the show I just don't like. It's got a good song, but that's about it. If you thought Pet Threat was bare, this is even worse. I actually legitimately can't remember anything from this episode aside from the song, and I've seen this thing so many times. I'd give it like a 4 out of 10, so it's not that bad, but wow. Compared to things like That Darn Ghost, A Pig Story, Red Sweater of Courage, or any of those other episodes I've talked about, wow, this is lacking. Just wow. We're on the home stretch here, guys, our last episodes. Shake, Rattle, and Roll Over. If I were gonna rank the episodes of Dave the Barbarian, I'd probably say Pig Story's number one, then I'd say The Cow Goes Moon, then Shake, Rattle, and Roll Over. Yes, it's that funny. And it goes just above episodes like King for a Day or Two or Slay What. The dialogue here is extra snappy. I could quote this thing all day. Your inferior step dancing sickens me! This is another one that would have been a good candidate to have come first. It's just so off the wall and so insane that it's hilarious. And again, the dialogue is really well done here, probably some of the best in the entire show. Whenever I write snappy dialogue or sarcastic characters or anything like that, I always look to this show, but most specifically, I look to shake, rattle, and roll over for inspiration. Hey, maybe you might be the same. It's worth a shot. Finally, our last episode production-wise, Bad Food. It's good, that's all I can really say. So that was everything you need to know about Dave the Barbarian. If you haven't seen the show before, it probably feels like you have now, right? This show was really something special. It was basically always laugh your head off funny. But it also had likable characters and it wasn't afraid to get real sometimes, most notably in Fiends and Family. This show did everything right. And I really wish Disney Channel didn't screw it over like it did. But now that it's starting to get a cult following that's growing bigger and bigger, there's some justice overall. And I'm really happy. This show really deserved it because it most certainly didn't get it at the time. Kids probably liked it enough, I know my circle definitely did, but once it faded away from Disney Channel, it faded away from their memories. That must be really heartbreaking for the people behind the show, you know, you put so much effort into it, you have a blast doing it, and uh-oh, the network treats it like garbage. This shows you that Disney Channel is not immune from doing this. We all point the finger at Nickelodeon for screwing everything over, or sometimes even Cartoon Network for shows like Sheep in the Big City or whatever happened to Robot Jones, but it happens here too. The mouse is no better than the splat. It doesn't matter if you're good. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of potential. It doesn't matter if McDonald's makes toys based off of your show. If they don't want you to succeed, they won't let you succeed even if you have all the means to do it. But the treatment of the show doesn't change the fact that Dave the Barbarian was absolutely amazing. And if you haven't seen it, or haven't seen it in a long, long time, go look it up on YouTube. All the episodes are available for you to watch. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? What's your favorite episode of the show if you've seen it? And if I convince you to give it a shot if you haven't, comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. Real quick, I'd like to thank our Patreon executive producers, Reziel, Leaf Razor, Azarius, Whoopdoo, Michaela Bellamy, MD the Dude, and Blackjack.
If you too would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then consider donating to our Patreon, which has a link in the description below. I do apologize in advance for throwing any of you off by my lovely voice, but for those of you who don't know, my name is Billy. I co-own the channel, I narrate a few of the videos, and I edit a grand majority of the videos on here. So, yeah, I'm a co-pilot, and it's a really good time indeed. Anyway, I'm going to be doing the comment of the day today because Trevor is unavailable at this time. Yeah. So, this comment is from Lennon Dash. Dude, it's Grandma Georgina! I knew she loved peanuts, but I never took her for such a gravy fiend. LOL. Yes, in case you don't know, that actress in the gravy commercial in Weird British Advertisements 5 is Liz Smith, who played Grandma Georgina in Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I don't know, it's just a funny connection, and you know what, it was an amusing little fact, and I cannot look at that commercial the same way again. So, yep, thank you for that. Thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll all see you in the next video, the next subscriber special. I, I want to go watch David Barbarian again, actually, you know, I mean, I, I like the show. Bad Food's my favorite episode.